Trinity community has been called to reflect upon the theme reconciliation. On Tuesday morning, we looked at reconciliation theologically to see reconciliation in a vertical way. This morning, I want to call our attention to look at reconciliation disproportionately, a more horizontal look at reconciliation. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus tells a story about disgracing grace. <laughs> Allow me to read this story to you because the prayers that we have prayed, it seems that Jesus tells this story reaching somewhere in the Near East, maybe Iraq, Iran, shapes this story. Peter came to Jesus and asked him a question, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And he began the settlement. A man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him since he was not able to pay. The master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, grabbed him, began to choke him, pay back what you owe me. His fellow servants fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could, could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. I counseled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. You can grace grace or you can <laughs> disgrace grace. 30 years have passed since the experience. Simon Eisenthal had written his little biographical sketchings in his story, The Sunflower, retracing his steps that morning when he was ordered to clean out the fields and the barn that would be turned into a hospital. And then the nurse came and said to him, you're wanted inside the hospital. Simon went in because the patient whose face had been wrapped was crying for a Jew. You see, he had worked with a battalion that had burned down a village, and particularly a house, and outside the house ran the mother and her children, and he, along with the soldiers, gunned the mother and the children down. And he was looking for someone to whom he could atone, and so he needed a Jew. Simon said, I'm one. He told a story, extended his hand, to shake Simon as a way of saying, forgive me. And Eisenthal said that his hand froze. He jerked it back. He could not bear to give that kind of benevolence, that kind of forgiveness to somebody who was the personification of evil and walked away. But at the publication of The Sunflower, 
Eisenthal had asked 32 people to weigh in on his writings to answer one question, did I do the right thing in not forgiving? The majority who responded simply said, you did the right thing. Justified or not, grace, disgrace. A similar thing happened to another Holocaust survivor by the name of Corey Ten Boom. Corey had become a spokeswoman for Christianity. She was all over the place. And she ended one night in Munich. And she had this grand thing because she had become the ambassador of forgiveness. And at the end of her speech, as she had talked about forgiving, she would go on to write to say that she really believed that she had mastered forgiveness. And that night, a gentleman walked up to her and said, Our Fraulein, God's forgiveness is good. And floods of memory came back. She remembered the delousing showers. She remembered the lecherous looking soldiers and she looked at the ogling soldiers that she and her sister who did not survive the concentration camps and extending his hand saying, Our Fraulein, God's forgiveness is good. She said she had to pray that night. She had thought she had mastered forgiveness. And it was only when she admitted again that she was not worthy of the forgiving grace of God was she able to extend that hand out and say, God's grace is good. I'm always amazed at how shoddy and cheap and thin when we talk about evil and grace in the world, the little things that we talk about, what forgiveness really looks like that doesn't matter much to anything. Somebody cut me off in a line. That's trivial, trivial. It's something when you put evil on a person's face, someone that looks like you, someone who actually acts evil out, it makes even those of us who claim to love Jesus with all of our heart very nervous. Something like that seems to be the setting of the story that Jesus tells. Jesus had been talking about forgiveness and talking about if one has, I guess, um, broken covenant with you, if someone has not forgiven you to forgive if you have ought against a brother. I think that's how Jesus would say it in the preceding verses, then go make things right. Now Peter shows up and you wonder, was Jesus talking about Peter and possibly some discrepancy between James and John? We don't know. But Peter makes his arrival in a very calculating, tit for tat, quid pro quo way a mathematical formula on forgiveness. You see, he knew what the rabbi said about forgiveness, that you could give, forgive up to three times. And Peter's pretty wise. He adds three, and then he adds another for good measure and says, Jesus, uh, I wonder, how many times should you forgive? Seven times, that's the formula. And Jesus responds in an outrageous way, in an incalculable way. Is it seven times or is it seven times seven or 70 times seven? Whatever it is, Peter had come short on what forgiveness looks like. Because as long as you can measure forgiveness, you probably haven't forgiven. It's only when forgiveness is beyond your ability to measure it. And that unnerves some of us. But Jesus wanted to give some more insight on that. And so he did what he often does when he wants to handle a real heavy subject. He tells a story. And he tells a story in three acts, I believe. And he begins by simply saying, there was a time when monarchs who ran their kingdoms on a whim without 
any reason. They just wanted to know what their net worth was. And they would call in their accountants to lay the books open and begin to just point out what the worth was. This is a time before you had spreadsheets and this is before accountants and CPAs. This is before Excel. And so you would just come in, the accountant would, and open the books and in front of the monarch begin to go down the line on every item and start pointing out maybe the people who worked in a particular area of the kingdom, laying out the accounting. And then the first name in the ledger, a servant. Now, this is not to be confused with fan-waving uh, servants. This is not to see as someone who's subjugated. This would be the equivalent of a vice regent, somebody who would be in a hierarchy in an institution. These were big ballers right here. These were people who really knew how to handle business inside of this monarch's domain. And there's a man who has a debt. And these are numbers that when people hear them, they wash over. And this man had a debt, 10,000 talents. Doesn't sound like very much to any of us here. We're seminarians. We have to dig through the readings of scripture. And, and so even then, it doesn't sound like that much, particularly when you just read it off in a church setting like this, he had a debt, 10,000. But you and I know, don't we, that that's an enormous debt, an outrageous debt, 10,000 talents. When Herod the Great was at the height of his governance, he only collected 900 talents in annual taxes. The Ark of the Covenant had only 30 talents worth of gold. 10,000 talents would probably be the equivalent of the Ephesian Empire at, on the, on, at the Acropolis. It would be the National Bank. In fact, here's a better way of saying it. This man owed the gold of Fort Knox. He's Bernie made off, making off before Bernie showed up. It's, it's huge. You owe that kind of money. And so there's only one thing that you do with a person like that. You, you throw him in jail. Now, the problem with throwing the man in jail is, is that in jail, he probably can't work off the debt. But can he work it off anyway? Throw his wife, throw in the children, sell all of his property to repay the debt. Well, the day wage is just a couple of denarii's compared to what he owes if the man had 600 million Days or 60 million days, he couldn't pay the debt back, not for what a day wage is. So when the people heard this, like you know it, that this story is so economically, financially out of bounds, that this is not a story about amazing grace, it's a story about outrageous grace. Because if you can add it up, then the story fails to do its work. And the man pleads then, have pity on me. He falls to his knees. You see it? Be patient with me. We use a word in the English saying that one is short-tempered. Be patient with me is be long-tempered with me. And then he, out of excitement, I guess, he really lies, doesn't he? I'll pay back everything. Because you and I already know he can't pay back everything. And then something enormous happens. 
the monarch does something that is so unexpected that people leave and say, this can only happen by outrageous grace. And that is, he waves his hands as only he can because it is his property, it is owed to him, and he cancels the debt. The man owed it. The owner canceled it. Sin has a way of setting off strange reactions, doesn't it? I mean, once sin gets loose, there's nothing that you can do to pull it back in order. You can't be Ulysses and Odyssey and go back to the future <laughs> and pull things back. You, can't, you just can't do it. You can't throw the 30 pieces of silver down like Judas and think that dismissing it and saying I'm done away with it it makes everything right as a boy whenever you would find still water anywhere there was just something instinctive that would make you find a rock that just throw a pebble in a pond and you already know what happens that one pebble sets off a concentric circle you, you throw a second pebble and there is another concentric circle and another and then you just start throwing rocks in and then concentric circles until they run and run and out of control and there's nothing you can do you can get in the water and you can't pull it back together years ago you probably remember like me that Walt Disney wanted to show at the height of the atomic bombings what these reactions would look like. They replay these even now. And he put in a room, not tens, but hundreds of mouse traps, and on each trap gently rested a ping pong ball. And then he threw one ball in the room. Now, you don't have to be a road scholar to know what happened. That one Ball triggered one trap that triggered two traps that triggered four traps until there was an exponential triggering and traps are all over the place and balls are all over the place and there's nothing you can do however you want to go in and pull them back together. You can't do it because now the reaction has been set. And yet, there is one that when our lives are completely out of control still possesses the ability to cancel out and end those debts. This would be a beautiful story if it ended right there. We could stop and we would say we have heard the gospel but it doesn't reach us completely at that moment, does it? Because there's a second act. And it moves from the outrageous grace to being careful not to disgrace grace. But when the servant went out in verse 28, that might be a way of saying he had been born again. He had been given a new lease on life. The wind is blowing cool in his face. He's been given a new page to write, a complete, a new chapter. It's a great day. But when the servant went out, he goes out and of all the things that he could do that day, he goes out to find. Now, these words, you know, Jesus is a master storyteller. And so when he's telling this story, he's choosing his words very carefully. He didn't say when he went out, he stumbled across. He inadvertently, he by happenstance. He said, no, intentionally on purpose, he set his GPS to go find somebody who was in debt to him. One of his fellow servants who owed him, well, 
He had been forgiven $50 million. He went and found a man who owed him $34. Outrageous. A $50 million debt canceled, and here he is looking for someone that owed him $34. And one scholar says he puts his hands on him, grabs him, and begins to choke him because that was a law in which you could turn a person's neck until their nose and mouth began to bleed. That's what he was doing. Strangling him right in the public. Pay me. Pay me. Pay back what you owe. And here is the contrast of the story. His fellow servant did to him exactly what he did to the monarch. Fell to his knees. Now, the forgiven debtor, the one who has a debt canceled, the roles have been reversed. He's the creditor now. Now look at what happened. His fellow servant falls on his knees. Sounds familiar? Beg, have long temperament with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. And he did to this man exactly the opposite of what grace had given to him. Seems like Jesus is trying to work with us on the level of memory. He wants us not to forget some things. He wants us to remember, working with memory, so that we too won't disgrace grace. There's a tribe in Polynesia that hangs these little heads in the doorway of their enemies that they've conquered. Shrunken heads hanging, so that when you come in, you don't forget your enemy, and when you go out, you don't forget your enemy. The blood feuds, not to forget them. And there they are. I looked at that and I thought about many of us, how we may not have shrunken heads, but we hang certain memories on our hearts as never to forget how God too has forgiven us. We've been forgiven at moments when we have exploited the 10,000 talents of grace that God has given to us, the 10,000 opportunities, the 10,000 treasures, the 10,000 privileges. It's easy to sit in church and sit around, and I've been doing this all my adult life now, and you sit there and say, that's for somebody else. But all of us, too, like that translucent resin that emanates out of those trees and captures a leaf or a butterfly or a fly. And they sell it in these little stores, you know, where you say, look at that beautiful piece of jewelry. <laughs> Some of us are like that. We have in case, closed in, contained unforgiveness and we pack it around just like it's a precious piece of jewelry. And we look at it day in and day out as never to forget, almost declaring, I will never forget it. This is why I meant earlier that there are times that when we talk about forgiveness, we talk about it in such trivial terms. What, what the story is saying that forgiveness is not trivial. This has nothing to do with going over to the grocery store, standing in the line marked six items and counting to see if the person in front of you have nine or ten items. Or somebody that cuts in line and we decide that we're going to pull them to the side and say, though you cut in line, I forgive you. <laughs> or somebody who dominates the conversation at the dinner party. That's not what he's getting to. This has something to deal with the very visceral level of life of disloyalty and betrayal. Disloyalty. That which affects us like those ripples when the pebble is thrown in the pond. It not just affects you, but those around you. Disloyal. 
of a husband to a wife or a wife to a husband and you're faced with a difficult challenge, can I forgive? Of a business associate who makes the promise that they will recommend you to promotion and then discovers that you may have a problem with the person to whom they have to report and they renege upon the problem or the promise. Disloyal to make a loan and then renege on it because they say, I got a better offer. A betrayal. That which you have entrusted something deep and secretive to someone else and now they put it in the hands of the loudest mouth in the community. Here is what Jesus is getting to, something that is deep at the core, at the bottom of it. That's what he's getting to. Well, one last thing, and it's just simply this. You never get away with it, do you? I mean, there's always somebody looking. Here the man (laughs) does the opposite of grace. He disgraces this outrageous grace that has been given to him. And when he thought he got away with it, there were other servants who saw what was happening. And the first thing that they do is to go back to the one who has the power to give grace and comes back and says, I've seen it all now. I just canceled out your incalculable debt. And now you're going to penalize somebody of a debt that you could pay or this person could work it off in just a matter of six or nine weeks. You never quite get away with it. Well, shouldn't you have forgiven? Forgiveness is not easy as people try to make it, is it? No. Anybody who says forgiveness is easy probably have never had to forgive. It wasn't easy for Jesus. It cost him his entire life. And I think, again, we so casually talk about that, that it leaves no effect on us. You know, we just said, well, he died for our sins. In my church tradition, when the preacher gets happy, And this is where it sounds like he's singing the sermon out. Sometimes the preacher say, he died. And the church will yell back, yeah. And then he says, didn't he die? And the church says, yeah. Or amen, or preach. And then he goes down the list, he died. Until the sun refused to shine. (laughs) He died, you see. These expressions are not just for emotion. These are to say, this death of Christ who gives forgiveness to us is a weighty matter. Nobody but a God could do that. We have to leave. I read the story of Sue Kidd. She's a nurse. She supposedly worked at the night desk this particular January but not this night. She went down to the room to work at Mr. Mills' room in room 719. Mills seemed to have had a slight heart attack and he said to Sue Kidd, the nurse, could you please call my daughter? She's the only living relative I have. And she said, I would. And then as she was leaving, Mr. Mills grabbed the sheets as if something was happening and said, please call my daughter. She's the only living relative I have. And then he asked, do you have a sheet of paper, a pen possibly? And Sue gave it to him. And she sensed that that was something urgent going on. And she called after she looked up the records, Janie. And calling Janie. Janie Belt it out, just belt it out. Oh God, oh, oh God, tell me he's all right. Just tell me a little bit. We're doing everything that we possibly can. And you can almost anticipate it, can't you? She gets to the hospital. 
And she stands in the corridor looking like a piece of glass that has been broken. Sue said she couldn't look at her. She took her in the room, said she could not look at her. And then when she turned her face away, she saw that piece of paper. It had a simple note on it. And it just said, Janie, I love you. I know you don't hate me. I forgive you. I hope you can forgive me too. Love, Dad. Someone has rightly said that the scripture is God's letter sent to a world that he came to save. And on every page, it reminds us, I love you, and I've come to save you. Forgive as I have forgiven you. Grace, outrageous grace. Don't disgrace it. Amen.